vice president of capital markets with Phoenix Capital Group. I'm a partner in the firm. Uh, just by way of background, I graduated in the mid 90s from the University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business with a degree in finance and uh, then be, began my career in investment banking with Smith Barney. Uh, so my entire professional career has been in and around capital formation uh, for both private and public companies. And as it pertains to Phoenix, I came internal to the firm several years ago to develop this division as like an internal capital arm to fuel the company's growth. So I'm operating in that same capacity, but I'm actually a full-time employee of the issuer. Um, so we already, we already talked about myself, so we're going to save us the experience. Now let's talk <laughs> about uh, the, the core of the company. So we're built on three key pillars, which are profitability, discipline, and security. So those are the underpinnings of everything that we do as an organization. Now, as it pertains to the financing of the organization, this is not something new. We have been issuing yield securities to investors for the past three and a half years. And at, actually, from a content perspective, it matches up nicely with uh, what Ramez was just sharing, because for the first two and a half years, the only offerings that we had were for accredited investors only. So we recognized that there was a larger audience that was being locked out of good opportunities. So we took it upon ourselves to go through the cumbersome process of filing a Reg A+. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the Reg A+, it requires virtually every same similar step, at least to uh, taking the company public. So audited financial statements, legal due diligence, background checks on myself and my partners. But the beauty of that is if you get qualified by the SEC, which we've been qualified to issue up to $75 million worth of the bonds we're gonna discuss, it allows you to open the investment to absolutely everyone. So that was exciting for us that we were able to open this to people that had been precluded from participating in our prior offering. So this is literally open to absolutely everyone. I won't belabor some of the points that are the obvious, but we've been in a radically low yield market for well over a decade. Um, this is just a snapshot of kind of the treasury landscape over time, the CD market as we sit here today. And our bond, which pays a fixed annual yield of 9%, stacks up quite nicely against the more conventional outlets for your yield investments. Now, of course, CDs and treasuries are not the only home for your hard-earned capital if you're looking for a yield investment. So what we've done here is just create a bit of a spectrum of some of the options out there from the shorter term, most conservative yield funds, all the way up the food chain to the institutional, more aggressive high yield funds. So just from a nominal standpoint, obviously our 9% bond still stacks up quite nicely, but I like to use this as an opportunity to point out two key differentiators. First and foremost, our bond has absolutely no fees, okay? So this is a fee-free investment. Every one of these other options is gonna have a fee of some sort. That could be a load fee, an assets under management fee, a brokerage fee. In essence, someone is making money off of your money. And our, our thesis is quite different. We're making money off of our business and we're using the bonds as a vehicle to grow that profitability. So we're investing our own money right alongside yours in generating increasing net income. That's how we make our money, not off of any sort of fees. Now, I don't want to belabor our year to date market experience and probably this should be updated at this point, but it's been a nowhere to run, nowhere to hide year to date in any conventional market. Also dovetailing on uh, some of the previous chatter is that we're at a 40 year high in inflation. So the goods and services that we've discussed that we require to live our lives cost more today than they did six or 12 months ago. Now we put that in, a, in an even larger context because when you're looking at a, evaluating a yield investment, the last thing you wanna do is commit your hard earned capital to a multi-year investment that has a, a yield that is not at least keeping up with inflation. So treasuries, CDs, some of the more conservative funds, you're effectively losing money, which of course is the investment goal of absolutely no one. Now we have just kind of touched around this in some of the initial discussion today, but this is why the, the market is acting or behaving like it is. So when we break it into asset class, you have fixed income, which is gonna be your publicly traded bonds, your yield funds, your preferred stocks that pay a dividend. They work inversely to the interest rate environment. So when you have rising interest rates, this asset class will have lower or reduced principal value because the, these securities will reprice to market expectation. And the only way for that to be effectuated is for the principal value to decrease. So while fixed income is viewed by many 
as a safe haven or a home for investors that are risk averse or conservative, that's true in a static interest rate environment, but far from the truth in a rising interest rate environment. Why are stocks going down? Well, economics works in cycles. We have seven to 12 years of expansion and two to five years of contraction and or flatline. Well, right now we have two major headwinds in the equity market. You have rising costs, thus the inflation, these companies, whatever they're manufacturing and transporting, et cetera, is costing them more, which is impacting profits. And you have rising interest rates and every single company, not every company, but the vast majority of companies has some sort of borrowing base, whether that's a revolving line of credit with their bank, a corporate debt issuance, you name it. The cost of capital is increasing as well. That's putting a drag on profits and the prospect of profit growth. And you're seeing that reflected in the equity market. Now, what do we do? We are in the domestic energy space. Specifically, we buy royalties, all right? So those are cash flows, monthly recurring cash flow contracts that come by way of the domestic production of oil and gas. Obviously, if you filled up your car recently, you know we're at a 10-year high. Candidly, we'd prefer to see it regress from here. Yes, we make an awful lot of money in a market like this, but it's not good for the country to have $110, $120 a barrel of oil. Our company is not built to require that to be extremely profitable, um, but we're in the market that we are today based solely on supply demand economics. So years ago, a couple, three years ago, we were energy independent here in this country. We've come off of that thesis and that made us a net importer. Then you cut off one of the larger supply chains and you see the unhinged moves that we've had. But nonetheless, we are in the domestic uh, energy space. We work alongside um, operators in five different states, which we'll get into. And it's not just oil. We're also uh, buying royalties on clean burning natural gas, which has quietly gone up over 300% in the last 12 months as we shift away from coal and power generation and use more and more natural gas in the heating and cooling of our homes. Now, why is oil likely to sustain itself at a higher price point? Not necessarily where we are today, but um, we're, we're not going back down to 89 cent gas anytime soon. One of the reasons is very simple, also based on supply demand economics. If you look at the last time oil was over $100 a barrel, about 10 years ago, companies were spending three times as much money in new exploration, new wells, et cetera. And that is not happening today. We're spending one third the amount in this new well. Some of that has to do with poli the political backdrop, et cetera. Some of that has to do with boards of directors of major companies saying, hey, you're not going to get as aggressive in expansion in this commodity cycle run. You're going to return funds to investors in the form of higher dividends, share repurchases, et cetera. That's having um, an impact, a constraint, if you will, on the supply side, which is uh, likely to keep gas prices and oil prices elevated. Like I said, not necessarily as high as they are today, but certainly not going to regress to where they were just during COVID, et cetera. Now, our advantage, as I alluded to very early in the discussion, is technology. We spent about $3 million developing a proprietary software platform. This is analyzing in real time all of these different opportunities. Uh, and there's over 100,000 individual mineral royalty opportunities in the database. And our investment thesis is very, very simple. We don't buy anything speculative. Everything we buy has production, has existing cash flow, and we are focused only on buying assets that have high near-term predictable cash flow. So we're very strategic in our focus. We only buy assets where we can recover our investment in 12 to 18 months and then enjoy the recurring monthly cash flow that comes from that royalty for years to come. Today, our portfolio has 225 individual mineral royalties. We work alongside 30 operators. Operators are the Exxons, the Conocos, the Occidentals, et cetera. And we have assets in five different states, which are North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, and Texas. Collectively, our portfolio has $160 million of assets, generates nearly $5 million in growing of monthly recurring cash flow. Our enterprise value as an organization is $600 million. And that 100,000 um, uh, individual opportunities in the database represents $500 billion. Here's an asset that I like to highlight for two independent but important reasons. One, just purely the financial attractiveness of the caliber of assets that are in our portfolio. And secondly, a very important tax component to our business, which is extremely germane as we get to how can we comfortably pay a fixed 9% yield in this market. 
first and foremost, the financial attractiveness. This is a larger asset here in our own backyard in Colorado, has a $10 million asset value, represents 551 royalty acre equivalents. And you can see we've already recovered $11 million. So that very quick payback period is being demonstrated here. And the nice thing about these royalties is after your investment is completely recovered, you're still generating considerable free cash flow on a recurring monthly basis. So this asset in particular is throwing off $350,000 a month of free cash flow and will for an extended period of time. Now, there are some favorable tax components in the oil and gas industry specific to some of uh, the asset classes that we invest in. So this asset is called a non-operated working interest. And owners of this uh, category of asset are subject to longstanding IRS code, which has never been in question regardless of the political party uh, at the helm. This allows owners of this category of asset to write off 80% of their tangible and intangible costs in tax year number one. So it's a very aggressive front end write off. And when used at a level where we acquire these types of assets that have an aggregate write off value equal to or greater than our ordinary royalty income, it allows us to legally and effectively pay zero state and federal income tax. So we've been effective in that tax-free strategy since day one, and we know that to be the case going forward for two reasons. One, we've already secured the basket of assets for 2022, and two, we know that'll be uh, available to us in perpetuity because we see a lot more of these opportunities than we currently have capital to deploy. Now, this brings a bit of humility to the story, of course, because we certainly did not get here alone. Far from it, we've had investors entrust us with their hard-earned capital for three and a half years. We have over 800 investors. Some are very large. Some are just getting started. And what's universally true about our investors is we treat them with honesty, with transparency. We're very good communicators. And I develop relationships with these folks. In this specific slide, these folks are all retired folks that maintain residence in Arizona. They invited me down there to uh, have a luncheon with them. These people welcome me into their homes. That's the level of trust and rapport that we develop with our investor base. And there's nothing that I take more seriously than being the custodian of someone else's hard earned money. That is the highest responsibility one can have and we treat it with that level of gravity. In fact, we're investing our own money right alongside yours. So we're absolutely aligned in all of our endeavors. I wanna get into the offering. I wanna get into the risk and I want to get into how we can comfortably pay 9% because that is gonna encompass our frequently asked questions. So the offering itself is very straightforward by design. It's qualified by both the Securities and Exchange Commission and FINRA. We've been qualified to issue up to $75 million worth of these bonds in this offering. And let's get into the mechanics. So the bonds are three years in duration. That's the length of maturity. That's the investment commitment length. They are three-year bonds. Like all corporate bonds, they are $1,000 uh, each. Okay, So any investment would need to be made as a round number multiple of $1,000 because that's the bond price. And by way of us specifically not listing the bonds on an exchange, they are fixed in value. So your bonds are worth $1,000 today. They're worth $1,000 three years ago or three years from now at maturity. Also fixed is the yield. There is a guaranteed annual rate of 9%. So that 9% does not fluctuate. It doesn't go up or down. That is your rate of return on an annual basis each of the three years. We pay the interest monthly. Uh, so if you take that 9% and you divide it by the 12 uh, months of the year, that comes out to three quarters of 1% per month. Now that is conveyed to our investors in a taxable account. We do that via direct deposit to whatever financial institution account info you furnish. And in the context of an IRA, we would send that right back into the IRA so that there would be no taxable event when using qualified funds. Now, if you're a taxable investor, you can effectuate the transaction at invest.phxcapitalgroup.com. However, if we're going to utilize the IRA club, which I encourage everyone to do, you will need to reach out to me directly because there is one additional step given the custodial nature of those funds. Now, I would like to use this time to highlight as well that there are no fees with our investment. Now, that doesn't just pertain to a taxable investment. Our company actually works alongside the IRA club to make this fee free. So Remez can get into the account details of what they're participating in, in terms of a special first time offer, but we also reimburse any fees that you would incur thereafter. 
so that you don't have any uh, you know, additional fees to get going if you're using qualified funds. So we can walk through that after I'm done with this presentation. This is a sample $100,000 investment. That's a very common entry point for our new investors. At 9%, clearly that would generate 9% per year. But since we pay monthly, you would divide that by 12 months out of the year. That would be $750 per month paid to our investors via that direct deposit on the 10th of each month. Over the three-year term, that's $27,000 of interest income. So we like to say equity-like returns without equity-like volatility, which I think in the against the backdrop of what we're currently dealing with has never been more relevant. Um, why I say that is if you look at any index over time, the average returns are 8 to 10%, but it's a true average. That average is a, a, a conjunction of years like we're in right now that are not good and years that are banner years that are up 25, 30, 40% and years that earn zero. So why not just skip the volatility altogether and get those exact same returns in a pre predictable, defined, orderly basis with no volatility? That's what a lot of our investors like is this is steady, predictable, you know what you have and what you're getting. And now we're really gonna get into the frequently asked questions. One of the questions that I get very, very frequently is, is this investment insured? The answer is you better believe it's insured, okay? Uh, oil and gas are commodities. We are not interested in taking undue risk. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of money hedging our portfolio, okay? Many of you may be familiar with hedging. Many of you may have heard the term hedging. I'm gonna regress it back to something we all understand and put this in the context of home ownership, all right? Let's say you own a home. Well, I would hope that if you own a home, you have homeowner's insurance. And what is that? You're paying a premium, whether that's to State Farm, Farmers, Allstate, doesn't matter who, you're paying a premium for what? For a defined outcome if something negative were to happen. That's insurance in a nutshell. So if your home burns to the ground, you know the outcome. State Farm is gonna cut you a check for the value to, or the, the cost to rebuild your home, all right? There's a defined outcome. Hedging is no different. We are paying a premium. That's literally what's a, what it's called. It's a hedge premium for a defined outcome if something negative were to happen. Now, what negative could happen in co the context of oil and gas? You could have radical price erosion like we did during COVID. So let's use a real world example so you can see how this actually works. I mentioned previously, if we put a million dollars out the door on an acquisition, we want to recover our million dollars in 12 to 18 months. But we're looking for 3x total returns over the life of that royalty. In the context of today's market price per barrel, um, be, we're sitting squarely between these two uh, data points at $110 a barrel. In the context of, of this environment, if oil were to remain static, which it never does, we, our million dollars would return to us a total of $3.3 million. So if oil continues to go up, we make more and more and more. If oil regresses, then we start to have uh, a regression in our royalty income. So what we do is we put a floor, we put a pin in the map at a certain exposure level, which currently is at $65 a barrel. Now, $65 a barrel is not something we pulled out of our hat. It's based on calculus. At that number, we achieve two things. One, we guarantee we make money as a company and lock in a healthy profit because that's the only way we make money. And two, at that level, we can cover all bondholder interest and redemption. So this is our form of insurance. This year, our hedge premium will cost us $1.2 million. So it's about the most expensive type of insurance that one could buy. But trust me, you're glad you had it when the market goes the other direction. So we're not be betting on commodity prices only going up or only remaining high. Finally, how can we pay 9%? That seems quite high. Human nature is such that if we see something that seems out of the ordinary, we immediately think it's too good to be true. Perhaps it's risky. What am I missing, et cetera? I wanna use math and math only if you'll allow me to, so you can understand why we can and comfortably do pay 9% rather than something uh, closer to four and a half or 5%. It's two company specific factors. One, taxes, okay? I mentioned that asset and the catalog of assets we have that allow us to run the company tax-free. Well, in essence, you're becoming the indirect beneficiary of that because absent a combined tax rate with the state of Colorado and the federal government of 40%, that's 40% more that we're keeping, that's 40% more that we're able to return to you in the form of higher yield. 
if we had ordinary taxes, this is a 5.4% bond right out of the gates, all right? Because that's 40% less than we could pay. So taxes is the main driver. The second is what we refer to as issuer direct savings. If you think of a company, any company, doesn't matter the industry, and they say, we want to raise $75 million. We want to raise $150 million. Chances are they do not have the internal expertise and wherewithal to do that themselves. And that's fine. That's why investment banks exist. So what that company would do is they would go hire Merrill Lynch. They would go hire Morgan Stanley or Piper Jaffray or any of the investment banks. And they would ask them to structure an offering and then go find the investors to place the securities, whether that's stocks or bonds, so that the company can complete that financing. Well, that comes with a healthy fee. Trust me, I did it for 22 years. And a placement agent fee can range between three and 10%. That comes right out of the issuer's net proceeds. And if we had that type of arrangement, we certainly could not be paying 9%. But we're fortunate enough that myself and my team have been doing capital formation and offerings for over 20 years uh, based on our expertise that we cut out that middleman. We issue our securities directly to you because it's not a challenge for us to raise 75 million. That eliminates that fee and creates a better investment experience for you, both from a communication standpoint and from an ultimate yield standpoint. So those two drivers are what's moving a bond that would otherwise be four and a half to 5%. Finally, building on safety. Hedging is certainly one of the most important components to that, because like I said, that's our version of insurance, but we maintain extremely conservative ratios. So I mentioned we have $160 million of assets in our portfolio. However, what's the liability? What's the obligations? What do you owe bondholders? That number is 37 to $38 million. So we, we maintain four times more assets than liabilities. And the way that that ratio stays intact is that we reinvest all of our own cash flows. There is one risk, all right? And I wanna be transparent about that. Anyone that says there's no risk is not being genuine. There is one risk. I find it to be very unlikely. Technically speaking, Apple stock can go to zero. The, the analysis that you need to make as an investor is how likely is that? I find it hard to believe that Apple's going to zero. So I consider that low risk. I would consider our risk to be comparable in terms of very unlikely. The single risk for us is if oil were to go beneath $20 a barrel and sit there for three plus years without any type of movement back. And why is that? Well, we can't hedge into infinity. I do not know where oil is going to be in 2025. And so we're covered in that rolling 24 month period. But if oil just craters and stays there, that's when we would start to have problems. Then we would have to start selling some assets to repay our obligations, which of course is our last resort, but we would always do in order to honor the bondholders. Finally, how to get involved. I'm not going to belabor this too much in the interest of time. This is, again, that portal where you can go through, et cetera. But IRA investors, which is why we are having this discussion, IRA investors will need to contact me directly. It cannot all be accommodated in the portal itself. For taxable investments, you can go through the four-page portal. The gateway to that portal is invest.phxcapitalgroup.com. takes about five to seven minutes. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to get into contact in info because they are going to uh, share it with you. Um, if you do want to jot down my direct line, that's fine. It's 720-805-3670. You can call or text anytime. So, uh, Matt, thank you again, buddy, for your time. Sure. You've always been uh, yeah. a great, no, this great, has been great. I always love, uh, I love doing this stuff. I'm glad to, to be a resource for everyone. And with that, everyone have a great day. I'm available as needed. And uh, Ramez, thanks again. And I'll be in touch. The information contained herein is intended to help the viewer successfully navigate common IRS and Department of Labor requirements to help achieve successful results from their IRA. The information is not intended to replace information from your legal counsel or income tax professional. IRA Club does not offer or sell any investment. All investments have risk.